Welcome to a video that I like to call the deep dive video, but I like to explain the name of this video and what it's about before you get started. The last thing I want to do is be accused of putting clickbait out there. The definition that I use for deep dive is that I do a number of videos every week. I do a daily video. I do a weekly video. I do an intermarket analysis video. Then at the end of the week, I look through all of the daily charts and I go back and I pick out those charts that maybe I didn't talk about, or maybe I only talked about one or two times because I'm trying to only use charts in the daily videos that are actually telling us something. Well, sometimes we're leaving some clues on the table when we do that. And so I put this together. There are a few charts that only apply to this video, but the other charts you may see sometimes if you watch the daily videos, well, sometimes we don't show those or I don't show those for a while. And so I put them together in this video just to see if we can get some additional insight as to what's happening. This is being prepared for Monday, November 20th. The first chart that we look at, and that's a chart that's only for this particular video. I don't show this in any of the other videos. We have the VIX on here, but you can't see it because it's invisible. Typically, what we do with the VIX is we use static numbers. <clears throat> when the VIX is dropped to 12 or below, that means there's really no fear in the market. When we get to 20 or above, that means that there's a lot of fear in the market. Well, on top of this, I have a 50-period exponential moving average, and this shows that we don't stay in those nice, neat little ranges all the time. There are periods of time when we are in a higher range, when the market's really going down, let's say, there's other times when we drop to a lower range. And then after the COVID plunge, we went back up to a higher range. Well, now we're possibly in the process of starting to develop a lower range. And we just want to keep an eye on this. We don't make decisions based on this chart. This is mainly for information, just to help us know what the environment is like. This is a chart that sometimes I use, and but most of the time I don't. I do a lot of sentiment studies. That's studying fear and greed. Now, when we're going up, and fear is become, or excuse me, greed is becoming more and more pronounced, we can roll with that. But it gets to a point where everybody just thinks the market's magically going to go up and they all turn bullish. Well, that's a lot of the times when we end up having a top. The opposite of that is true. When we're really going down, people think the market's never going to go up again. They want nothing to do with it. We see a real washout. Sometimes it even leads to a crash. And that's when we're starting to look at having the opposite view or a contrarian view. And we use one of the tools in the whole package together is called the VIX. And that measures the volatility of stocks. Lately, it's been pretty helpful. And I use some other charts each day that give us some good insight as to what's happening with sentiment. Well, sometimes the VIX gets a little crazy. And so this is an additional chart where I take a correlation between the VIX and the S&P 500, and that creates this line right in the middle. And when we pay attention to this chart is when it really spikes up above this dashed area. It's not doing that right now, so that's why I haven't been including this in the daily videos. Another thing that we want to keep an eye on is how fast is the VIX moving? And we use an RSI based on nine periods to measure that. Now, remember, the VIX goes in the opposite direction of stocks. When they're going down, the VIX is going up. When stocks are going up, the VIX is going down. Even though we have been dropping as the market's been going up, we're not getting in, into any kind of an extreme reading. If we break above 70 or below 30, that's when I use this chart in the daily videos, and we're not there now. This is another study that we look at. The move index measures the volatility of bonds. The VIX in the middle, it measures the volatility of stocks. And then very simply, I have the green line here is the VIX minus the move index. And this gives us the overall spread between the two. And we've been going up a little bit meaning that the VIX is actually overpowering the move index just a little bit, but it has pretty much been going sideways. What I pay attention to the most is at the very bottom. How are the top two charts correlating with each other? And they're pretty much neutral right now when we measure volatility of bonds versus volatility of stocks. Then just to keep an eye on things, I only show this in this particular video. How far are we from the all-time high? We set that in early June, January 2022. Over on the right-hand side, that's where we closed on Friday. And right now, we're down 6.32% for the S&P 500 going back to the all-time high. 
Then we also do a number of different advanced decline line studies. I do them on the S&P. I do them on the NYSE. We look at the NASDAQ. We look at the NASDAQ 100. Well, one study that I end up showing sometimes because it's telling us something, but right now, lately, I haven't been showing it, is a common stock advanced decline line just on the NYSE. The top part is based on price, where it's been showing some improvement, and the bottom is based on volume, and it's also been showing some improvement. What we're looking for here are any kind of divergences. Just for example, we're seeing an improvement here based on volume, where we're coming to take out this previous shorter-term high, but we haven't quite reached that yet based on price. Now, that could be positive. That means that volume is actually leading price higher. You could also see this as negative, saying that, well, a lot of people are buying in here and volume is looking good, but we're not seeing a confirmation based on price. So there's a couple of different ways to look at this. But for the most part, this isn't really giving us any glaring signals right now. Then the technical alerts are put out by stockcharts.com. All of the charts that I use come from that site and service. They have another service that they provide, which are automated alerts. When the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, NASDAQ 100, different sectors, different indexes, when they achieve some kind of a technical event, those are registered by stockcharts.com and they can be delivered to you by email or by text message. I just look at them on the screen since I'm pretty much watching the market all the time. And then they come as a list at the end of the week. And this is a screenshot from stockcharts.com. I only have Friday's session on here because we had a lot of alerts generated for the whole week. We start reading this from the bottom and go up. When it's a positive thing, it's either blue or green, depending on what color you see. When it's red, that is negative. And different events can happen. And this can give us an idea of what's happening in different areas of the market. And that can be helpful. Typically, when we're going higher, we see a lot of green or blue. When we're going down, we see a lot of red. Then we also look at different indexes. Now, for everything that I teach about, all the strategies that I do and teach, they're based on the S&P 500, but we keep an eye on other indexes too. And where is the S&P in relation to other indexes? Stockcharts.com has this unemotional objective method for looking at a chart and then giving it a score on a scale of zero to 100. The higher the number, the better looking the chart. And we look at five indexes. We look, of course, at the S&P, the Dow, the NASDAQ 100, the mid caps and the small caps. And coming in first place, again, are the QQQs. They're holding up best. And you can see kind of a historical value for this score over a period of time. They're coming in at 97, and they're looking the strongest right now. In second place is the S&P 500, because they have a lot of mega caps in them as well. And that's really what's held up the market. Although we are seeing some improvements in the broad market, at least in the week that just ended, it, the S&P is coming in with a score of 86.9. In third place is the Dow at 75.4. In fourth place are the mid caps, which had been showing a lot of weakness. They're starting to show some improvement here at 49.4. And then in last place are the small caps, which were down into the teens. So they're really starting to show some improvement over here coming in at 31.2. Then we look at some short-term charts that sometimes they're in every daily video that I do. Other times you might go a long period of time and not see them. This is a short-term rainbow. And I typically don't show this because it's longer term. It's not necessarily really telling us anything. You're meant to look at this whole chart together to kind of get some perspective. These colored lines on here are from 10 periods up to 50 periods of a simple moving average. And we can get an idea. What's the market looking like? We look at kind of the waves. We look at where is price in relation to all of the lines. Are the lines going up? Are the lines going down? Are we chopping all around and getting all messed up like spaghetti? Or are things flowing in a better direction? Right now, we've been able to break back above the short-term rainbow, and that's turning the lines back up, which is showing some improvement that we're seeing in price. <clears throat> Another study that we do based on moving averages which are calculated in a different way, we have a double exponential moving average and a triple exponential moving average. And the green line here is the double. The blue line is the triple. And ba again, based on 20 periods, and when this is going up, especially when price is above both of these lines, that's more positive. That means we're really going up pretty well. We've also been seeing lately where the green line is crossing back over the blue line, and that's also suggesting that things are turning back more positive. Then we have a regular 20 period moving average study. And I calculate both a simple moving average, which treats all 20 periods the same, 
or an exponential moving average where it's like a weighted moving average where more recent prices weigh more heavily into the calculation. And there's the debate that goes back and forth. Which one is better? I use both. Well, we're well above the 20 period moving averages here on this chart. And to make it even a little bit more positive, the exponential moving average moves quicker than the red line, which is the simple moving average. And when that crosses above the red line, that's also suggesting that things are turning more positive. Then we have some intermediate term charts. We start with an intermediate term rainbow going from 50 periods up to 100 periods. And the same philosophy applies here. We're above the rainbow. We can look at this from beginning to end and kind of get an eyeball look at how are things looking overall technically. Then I, I look at this every day and this is an important indicator. This is the NYSE McClellan oscillator. I focus on the S&P 500 McClellan oscillator, but if you want to get a broader measure of the market, you have to look at the NYSE. And when this is going up, that's more positive. When it, And anytime this is above zero, that means the corresponding summation index is also going to go up as well. When we drop below zero, the summation index goes down. Well, we're looking more positive here with the NYSE McClellan oscillator, and we're not necessarily extreme positive. I have been really focusing on the S&P McClellan oscillator because it's starting to get extreme positive, meaning that we might be showing good momentum. That's the positive side. Or maybe we're due for a pullback because we've gone up pretty far pretty fast. Then we look at the percent B indicator, and that goes with the Bollinger Bands up on top, and they're very popular. What this measures is any time that we close outside of the upper or lower Bollinger Band, and we haven't done that. Well, we did that not too long ago. But you notice that we don't stay there for very long. So this can be a really good extreme positive or negative indicator because we don't spend much time there. So once we hit this, that's usually kind of a big deal. Right now, we are coming down, but we're above this dashed midpoint here. So we're positive, even though it has been declining. This is due more to the fact that the S&P has been chopping sideways for the last number of days. Then we look at an anchored moving average going back to the all-time high. And we were coming down to this level a few weeks ago, and we actually broke below it. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, things are just going to turn terrible. Well, we were able to capture that, and then we've been really running back up to the upside. So since we're getting further away from this kind of rust red line here, I haven't been showing this. Maybe you'd say it's maroon. I don't know. I'm not really good with color names. Then we have a Connors RSI, which is very similar to a regular RSI. It tries to pick out overbought and oversold conditions. But this one is pretty spastic. It really moves. It's a lot faster than a regular RSI. But we don't get a lot of extreme readings with this. We did get one back in October, and then we started to come back down. And then usually you can say, well, are we more positive or are we negative right now? When we're above the dashed line, we're more positive. When we're below the dashed line, that's more negative. Currently, we're above the dashed line. Then we have the same idea with a double and triple exponential moving average based on 50 periods. And we're well above both of these lines. And we're starting to see the red line cross above the blue line, which is turning things even a little bit more positive. Then we have a regular 50 period moving average study. And we've been getting kind of far away. So that's why I haven't been showing this. And we're also seeing the green line going above the red line, which is turning things more positive. Then we have a 100 period moving average study. We were right in between the simple and exponential moving average for quite a number of days. Well, we've been able to break above that. And just as kind of a side note, you can see we're hitting this R2. That's called a pivot level. And I rely heavily on these. And you notice that the S&P has been having a real difficult time breaking through that. We're seeing the same thing with the Dow, the NASDAQ 100, and the NASDAQ right now. That's an additional thing. But since we're kind of far away from the 100 period moving average, I haven't been showing that. Then we want to know, are we above or below the 200-day simple moving average? That's usually the line in the sand between positive and negative. When it's green and going up, we're moving further to the upside above that moving average. Then this is a chart that I put together. All these measurements are approximate. I have to eyeball these, and you move it just a little bit, and the numbers totally change. But when we hit the high back on July 31st, and then that's when we really started to run into some trouble with the market. We were really going up strong before that. This was bouncing up off the uh, October 2022 low. And then we started to run into some problems. And then we fell down. Now, according to this chart, it was a little bit over 11%. 
when you if you tuned into the media during that time, they're like, oh no, 10%, uh, the world's gonna end. Well, I do it on an intraday basis. And I think they were measuring this from a closing basis. So that's why our percentages are a little bit different. We came down to this level, and since <clears throat> that time, we've been bouncing back up and showing some improvement. We also look at a thing called a 50-day cycle. And there's people that think that certain numbers of cycles are important. A seven-day cycle, a 33 and a third cycle, a 149 cycle. And there's probably some validity to that. Because if you draw enough lines on a chart, eventually you're going to find something that might work. Over the last year, according to what I've been seeing, I think the 50-day cycle has been helpful. Doesn't mean we use this to make decisions. This is just for information. And you can see we hit the COVID low here at the end of a 50-day cycle. Sometimes we hit a top and then we pull back. Other times we just stalled out for a while. Other times we actually hit a top and started to come down. Other times we hit a bottom and started to go back up. Well, we started a new cycle on October 17th, and the next cycle, believe it or not, it's going to actually start January 1st, according to 50 days, that's trading days going forward. This will probably be January 2nd or 3rd because the market's never open on January 1st. Then we want to keep an eye on the S&P 100, and then that's the biggest stocks that make up the S&P 500, just to see if they're performing about the same, and lately that has been happening. This is a point and figure chart. It does not take time into account. It just looks at movement. When a certain stock or index goes up or down a certain amount, if it goes up, it draws an X. If it goes down, it draws a zero. And then we can get some chart patterns here and we actually get some signals. We did not We did see some new Xs drawn on the weekly chart, but not here on the daily chart, at least after Friday's session. But this is looking more positive. And the last signal that was generated was a low pull reversal that came on November 2nd. So long-term charts, here's another rainbow chart. The same concept applies. We're above all of the lines in the moving average. And this goes from 50 periods up to 250 periods. And these lines didn't really turn down all that much because they're longer moving averages. The more we can stay above all of these lines, the more they will smooth out and start to look even more positive. Then we have a weekly chart of the S&P on top. We have the German DAX, which is the biggest stock market in the EU that belongs to Germany. And we just want to know, are they going in the same general direction? It doesn't say if they're going up or down, but lately they do have a pretty strong correlated relationship. So if the S&P and the German DAX, if, if one's going down, the other one is likely going down. If the one's going up, the other one is likely going up as well. We just want to keep an eye on this. Then this is kind of an interesting study that I ran across where you take the 10-year yield and you subtract the German 10-year yield, and the result is this nice little line that we have drawn up here. But what's interesting about this is we can compare this line to the U.S. dollar index. Hmm. Well, what we do to see how valid these lines are moving in the same direction, we also have another correlation study here. When we're up in this blue area, that means that the dollar index is tending to follow along the result that we get in the very top part of the chart. Kind of interesting. Now, when this is going down, that tends to be more positive for stocks. When it's going up, that's more negative. You think about it. You take the 10-year yield. Stocks don't like interest rates to go higher. You take the German yield. German stocks don't like interest rates to go up either. And then the dollar, stocks don't like a strong dollar. And then you can compare the two. So when both of these are going up, that means interest rates are going up and the dollar is going up. And that usually puts headwinds on stocks. When this starts to go down, that often gives good support to stocks. So we just want to keep an eye on the correlation between them. Then I have some different support and resistance levels. Sometimes this makes up the bulk of the daily videos. Lately, not because we study a lot of Fibonacci levels. And we're kind of in no man's land right now. But the first one, this isn't really a level. This is more of a kind of its own little indicator. It's called a mass index. And how the signal is generated is we go above the red dash line. And when we go above the blue line and then come back down below the red dash line, that is a signal. Well, it gave us almost a legitimate signal back in September, but that ended up not being a very good signal. It didn't give us a full on signal here in October. And that ended up actually telling us before we hit the bottom, this was starting to come back down and that actually would have been a legitimate signal, but it doesn't fit the definition of what this indicator tries to do. Then we do have some other support and resistance levels by using trend lines. This goes from the June 2022 low to the October 2022 low, and there's a line, a trend line between the two. 
Then I went to the all-time high and then drew a parallel line with the lower trend line up here. When we were going up last spring, we bumped into this a number of times and it was acting as overhead resistance. Then we were able to break through it. And then I stopped showing this chart. As we were coming back down, I extended this line because I'm like, okay, where are we going to stop here? Maybe if we keep falling, this may provide some kind of support, but we never got down that far. And since we've been going back up, I stopped showing this chart. Then what I did is I measured from the COVID low to the all-time high, and you just break these up into 25% chunks. They're known as quadrant lines. And believe it or not, there's something to this. We were bumping up to this before where it was providing resistance, and then we were finally able to break through it. We did break down a little bit below it, but then it was more positive when we were able to get back above this particular area. So sometimes it'll act as support. Other times it will act as resistance. Then we have a short-term FIB chart, and we're up above the 100% retracement level now, so it's really no use to show this as long as we continue to go up. If we start to fall, then I'll dust off this chart and start to show it. Here's a longer term FIB chart where we're above the 61.8% retracement level. We've been able to break through that. The next area would be a full 100% retracement and we're far away from that and we're still well above this other level. So unless we start to fall, I won't be showing this chart. Here's another really long term FIB chart. And what's interesting about this is that we have two Fibonacci levels right on top of each other. That's why you see a kind of a neon blue and a green well, we've been able to break above that now, and so I haven't been showing this chart. It's what I say it's in no man's. It's when I say it's in no man's land. Then this is an indicator that I developed decades ago, and I actually used it with a particular strategy. I don't do the strategy anymore, but I kept the indicator. This is very simple. It's just a 20-period simple moving average of the open, high, low, and close. And that draws kind of a little mini rainbow here. And we're well above the rainbow, and the rainbow is starting to turn back up, so I haven't been showing this chart. Here's the Ichimoku cloud. I was showing this every day for quite a while because this, when we're coming back up and we were inside this red cloud, that was providing overhead resistance. Since we've been able to break above that, I've stopped showing this chart. Now, we run into some problems and we start to come back down. I will be showing this chart again because then it may end up providing support. Then we look at the Fibonacci study for the NASDAQ 100. We're also in no man's land again here. So unless we really start to fall, I haven't been showing this chart. Then the financial sector, which has been doing okay lately. It got hammered last March with all the banking crisis and the banks going under and everything. Well, this is a long-term look. And we hit a high back in 2007. And then we had the great financial crisis. And then it took us years and years and years to get right back up to that previous all-time high. And wouldn't you know, this was when the COVID bond started. I always found that to be very interesting. These charts can tell you things, okay? We had the COVID plunge, and then all this liquidity was shoved in to the U.S. economy, and that just shot this thing higher. Well, now that we're starting to run into problems, the financial sector has been under a lot of pressure, but it's been able to establish a support level at this previous high. What's what was once resistance now becomes support. Yeah, we came down below it a few times, but for the most part, this is held up. And we're getting a little further away from this, so I haven't been showing this chart. We look at some broad market charts. This is the Vixen, which measures the volatility of the NASDAQ 100. I mainly look at the lower chart because it's a line chart and it shows that volatility has been decreasing. We have a weekly chart of the QQQs, which represent the NASDAQ 100, and then an anchored moving average going back to the all-time high. We're well above this. In fact, we're looking at possibly even breaking out here, or this might provide overhead resistance. But since we're far away from this line, I have not been showing this chart. Here's the bank ETF, which really took a dump back in March, and it's pretty much been going sideways. Now, it's showing a little bit of life these days. We've been able to break above the 200-day moving average. We're still in a downtrend, and we're still underperforming, but this is showing some improvement. Then we look at the regional banking ETF, and we compare it with the financial sector, and it shows that the regional banks are really underperforming. Now, both the financial sector and regional banks have been under pressure, but the regional banks have been doing even worse. Then we look at a ratio between the QQQs, which is the NASDAQ 100, and the Dow, or the Diamonds, which is the ETF for the Dow Jones, and we just look at the correlation. They have a pretty strong correlated relationship, even though it has been weakening lately. Then we're comparing shorter-term bonds with further out bonds, and I've used this in numerous different videos here. I just wanted to show this, but 
earlier in the year, the market was pretty convinced that the Fed was done raising interest rates. And so this ratio started to go down. Shorter term bonds were starting to underperform further out bonds. Folks were locking in further out bonds to lock in a higher yield. Well, then everything shifted and the market started to freak out. And we saw this ratio starting to go back up. Now we're starting to see it come back down again as the market deals with where our interest rates going to go. Then we compare TIPS, which are Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. That's what you want to buy in a high inflationary environment because you can renew them and they can adjust their interest rates. And if interest rates are going up, you just keep re-upping at a higher interest rate. When we're in that kind of an environment, people want to buy TIPS. When we're in a more stable environment where longer term interest rates are more attractive, that's when you get into three to seven year bonds. And for a while, the tips have been really outperforming as inflation was going up. But lately, this has really been coming down. Have some rate of change charts. These are just for informational purposes. This looks at Friday's close and then compares it to 250 trading days ago. And we're showing a little bit of an improvement here. Here's a longer term chart going back to 1980 to give us a little bit bigger perspective. Then I haven't shown this in a while and I actually developed this chart for a whole different reason. But this is a weekly chart of the S&P and a weekly chart of the MACD. It has been going down as the market was really running into problems. It hasn't crossed over positive yet, but it is showing some improvement. If we have another good week or two, this could actually cross over and go back positive. Looking at some bonds, this is the three to seven year bond and comparing it with the S&P 500. When this is going down, that means the bonds are underperforming. Bonds were doing well as the stocks were going down, but now we're seeing this ratio really going down. Then we look at the TLT, which is the 30-year bond ETF. That's in blue, and that's been going up, and we compare it with the S&P, and that's been going up too. And we can see, based on 50 periods, they have a long-term, strongly correlated relationship, and they have a fairly strong, shorter-term relationship based on 10 periods. Then down here, I just have a couple of different measurements to show you the spread between the two. This chart, I don't think, is helping us at all. This is showing the value to growth ratio. That's the black line, which is going up. And then the 10-year yield, which has been coming down. And this chart is telling us that they're going in the same direction. Well, you can just see right here. No, they're not. They're going in opposite directions. So I've really been disregarding this chart as of late. Then we look at a ratio between the QQQs and the long-term bond TLT ETF. And they, the relationship isn't as strong as it has been, but it's still fairly strong, meaning that stocks in the QQQ and long-term bonds have been tending to go in the same direction. Then we keep an eye on the yield curve, the two-year, 10-year to the two-year, and the 10-year to the three-month. Those are the big ones. That's what most people tend to focus on. They've been going up a bit, but they're still inverted. Where we've been going back and forth with the 30 to the 5 and the 10 to the 5, those aren't as important. I just include them because they're easy to watch. Then I have a thing called possible positive scenarios. When we're really going down and it looks like we're forming some kind of a bottom and we're seeing some extreme negative readings, I pull out these charts and sometimes they can give us some really good insight. Well, we can also use them at other times as well just to give us the overall health of the market. The first one is we look at the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their 200-day simple moving average. And this is starting to climb back above 50 now. So above 50 and below 50 is kind of the line in the sand between positive and negative. Then we do a 50-period moving average of the S&P, and this is showing some improvement over here. We also look at the mid-caps, which are showing improvements. And we're also looking at the small caps showing some improvement as well. So thank you. I really hope you found this helpful. This is not meant to be a standalone video. I know a lot of people like this and they enjoy this video and that's great, but you're going to get more of context and more of an in-depth explanation if you actually look at the daily videos. In spite of that, I hope you have a really good weekend and I will talk to you in the next video.